future, talk radio will actually educate, inspire, and make you think. The future is now. Topics and music that affect your life from Universal Broadcasting Network. Tune in at ubnradio.com. Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Starts now. Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Uh, we're here every Tuesday at 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific time on ubnradio.com, channel one. And, uh, well, I guess before we get started, there's a couple things. We definitely would like to thank our sponsors, uh, Conundrum Red and Conundrum White. Uh, great wines. You can solve most anything. We have, we have to toast. As dealing Cheers. with a co-host, I can solve it with a wine. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I forgot to drink. Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's bad luck. Oh, okay. Okay, so we also have Barkeeper in Silver Lake, uh, Film Festival Flicks, and uh, Nearly Famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches. That's me. Yeah. What did you do this weekend? I saw four movies at the Academy. And actually, I felt that summer had finally arrived because they were really good. I thought it was because it was 97 degrees out. (laughs) No, because I saw Love and Mercy. At, which is all about uh, the Beach Boys, and Brian Wilson was at the Q and A, and the best question that he answered was, "What did you think of the movie?" And he said, "I really liked it. I saw it five times." Wow, well, I that, 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 that is a testament. Five times. <laughs> okay, but the, be- the the most fun I had was Spy with with Melissa McCarthy. I mean, I I really, if you're down, and you're really just want to forget it was a funny movie and then i saw from pixar inside out which has an open jet and i got to tell you something if you have kids this is the most amazing thing it's beautiful the the stuff goes over their head but the the message they're going to get for those eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds about the power of emotion um is just unbelievable and then i saw a documentary on nina simone and i spoke to the documentary maker and invited her to the show and she said i live in new york <laughs> well that's... wait let me tell you what i said to her i said okay. well when you have oscar consideration come to the show because they're running that documentary mm-hmm. um june 23rd for just a short time so it will qualify okay. for the oscars now that's what i did i won't ask you what you did or should i no no my my, my weekend was uh, you know uneventful family having barbecues with celebrity trainers and celebrity dietitians, so you can imagine how comfortable I felt at the pool party. I was going to say, did anybody eat? Yes, <laughs> undercover. <laughs> well, you know, I called you up yesterday, and I said, I have to ask you a question about sex, which I did to get your attention. Okay, you know that. I wanted to know, because I only know about studio sex, is do they have, like, sexual harassment and the couch in the indie world well yeah i mean first of all it's this kind of phrase that a lot of times like flirting is what happens if you like it harassment's what happens if you don't but yes the, but, but there is the, the instance where there's a lot of people who say i will finance your film if you do xyz if you want to get ahead of my company then xyz the difference is, I, I don't know the studio world. That's your world. The people who play that game in the indie world are, yeah, they're fakes. Well, you, you don't have to play that. So, but, um, it, you know, we can get more into that later. But I'd say, you know, Scott's here. And as we know, he, he just, just arrived from Denver. So Why he's much we, more interesting to talk, to talk th- about than this. Well, you know, the interesting th- thing about Scott, teach me how to say your name, please. Uh, thank you. It's Scott Takeda. At least I didn't call Takeda. you John again. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Takeda. Yeah. Well, and, and, and also, I got to say, like, uh, you know, talk about, you know, sex and harassment. Scott, you were, you were in Gone Girl. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, talk about a film that left me extremely uncomfortable. I, I actually read the book and, mm-hmm. you know, it was like a nightmare. Yeah, there it's uh, it's uh, it's a wild roller coaster of a ride, that entire film. And the book as well, too. Um, so, uh, and it, and it was a, a real, um, thrill to be kind of a part of it. You know, David Fincher obviously directed that and, um, it's, you know, it's about manipulation and the relationship between a, a husband and wife and, 
is what what is actually real and what actually goes on behind closed doors. I'm very curious on the set because it is a tense movie. Mm-hmm. Did you all feel that tension? Or were you just all, you know, acting for that moment in the scene, dropping it and going away? I just felt sorry for the men in the film. (laughs) How easy they can be manipulated. It's so true in real life. Oh, Oh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, (laughs) who knows? Uh, You know, um, for my, you know, I think there was uh, about 100 days of shooting. Uh, I was there for two of those days. Um, I I didn't really sense a lot of tension on the set. I mean, there was certainly tension as far as, well, it needed to be kind of a tense scene as we were observing the fact that, uh, you know, um, that, uh, you know, the the girlfriend has gone live and is, is, is doing a press conference and kind of blowing the whole idea that, you know, uh, Nick was going to be uh, having an exclusive interview um, so that part, you know, you needed to obviously be an actor and be true to what, what, what the story was, but I didn't necessarily feel tension on the set otherwise. Well, you started out in Pocatello, Idaho. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm very impressed. Yeah. And, but you're an on-air, uh, reporter, um, which mm-hmm. I salute you because that's not an easy job. So I can understand breaking in in Pocatello. Mm-hmm. I broke in in Phoenix. Phoenix a long oh, time wow. ago was a smaller market than it is today. Sure. So how in the world did you end up from Pocatello to Hollywood? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, I started out with at uh, KIDK News 3 uh, in uh, Pocatello slash Idaho Falls. It's a hyphenated market. Um, and, you know, because I, I really had no initial desire or dream to to be on camera as far as through narrative films, you know, television, film in Hollywood of sorts. I kind of wanted to, to be a journalist. And, and I think through the the process of being very, very young looking, <laughs> you know, it, it um, the only way to advance through television at that time is to, to jump from market to market. And I just looked too young. I, I, I was mistaken uh, for a high school student uh, many times. Uh, so I went behind the camera, and I think I, I missed being able to tell stories in front of the camera. So that started kind of planting a seed for me, and eventually, um, you know, I just decided to take uh, some acting classes and then got an agent. So you weren't like one of these kids doing all the school plays. Acting came late? Acting kind of started cam- uh, coming a little bit late. I can actually remember, um, I think it was third grade, uh, our teacher handed out a play. And um, I was so enamored with the idea of acting. I actually had memorized the, all the parts and at one point was at home, you know, playing all the parts. And so I think that was kind of a, a little bit of, a, of an idea that this somehow, some way could be a way to earn a living. Um, and, and, uh, but uh, no, it, it, then it stayed fairly dormant for a while. Well, actually, earning a living as an actor doesn't have to be a profitable, profitable situation. There are more actors earning less money, and then we see a few at the top. Exactly. So why be so brave? I mean, you're a working actor. You're what everybody in Hollywood wants to be who isn't, is that you do go from film to film. Mm-hmm. You don't have to work every single day, but you can earn a decent living working. Yeah. Um, s- slight correction. I mean, I don't earn a hundred percent of uh, my income strictly in, in in front of the camera. Uh, I still uh, earn a living behind the camera as a director. So um, when I, I do tend to go from set to set to set, but sometimes I'm in front of the camera and sometimes I'm behind the camera. So, yep. so wait, and, wait, 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 I just have to pick okay. up when you're in front of the camera sure. and you're the di- and you're really in your other. Mode, do you second guess the director who's directing you for that moment? Not if their name is David Fincher. No, not at a. M- no, no. I'm. I'm just like, you know. Actually, what I do, like when I'm on set, a lot of times when I'm in front of the camera, is I just love being on set. So if I don't have to be in my, in in the trailer, um, and if they'll allow me just to be on set, and I'll, <laughs> it's like I will be a quiet as a mouse. And just to watch how another director runs a set, it's really fascinating to, to learn um, learn how they like to tell a story, learn how they, how they like to run a crew, 
um, for me, that's that's a, that's a great thrill. I was actually on set yesterday for a commercial, and just to watch the directors and how they kind of ran things, it's like, oh, I that was I learned a lot. So, so uh, two questions uh, between projects: uh, How do you fill your time? Do you take acting classes? Do you teach? Do you do research? Do you just sit back and enjoy enjoy the world? Yeah. <laughs> um, Yes to kind of all of the above. Um, you know, there's actually not a lot of downtime for me. Um, so I happen to be, I, I, you know, fairly fortunate in the fact that, um, you know, I think it's actually an actor's job, quite truthfully, to be auditioning. <laughs> so, you know, when you're lucky enough to book and actually to get in front of the camera and work, that's great. But, it, you know, it's a numbers game. So you're constantly auditioning. Uh, I, I, I feel very fortunate that I have a lot of very good coaches, so I am in workshop whenever I can, uh, trying to keep uh, everything sharp. I, I must spend probably three hours a day on IMDb researching things. You know, either an audition comes in or I'll see kind of a trend or I'll read something in Variety. And it's like, oh, what about that? And, you know, you're kind of researching stuff. Um, and then, you know, um, we're all kind of independent contractors, so it's, it's always about marketing. It's always about getting your, your name out there. It's always about meeting people. So it's kind of a never-ending process. And when I'm not doing this, I'm also a photographer. So I've got an art show coming up in Croatia that I'm getting ready for. Incredible. How, how do you switch on and off with your mind? That's it. It's a lot of, they're all artistic, but they're three very, very different things. They are different, but they're all, at a certain point, they all are about visual storytelling. You know, it's either you're telling a story um, through performance and emotion in front of the camera, or it's, it's telling a story with a singular image as a photographer, or it's telling stories with 24 frames in a second. Uh, so it's all kind of based a little bit around visual storytelling. In today's Hollywood, and mm -hmm. how are you cast? Are you cast as an agent, or are you cast as an actor who speaks English with an American accent? Uh, that's a great question. I, I've I've kind of come up with the idea that I'm I'm kind of the the Asian everyman. Uh, I I've been very fortunate that when they are looking for someone who is more ethnic, I can channel my grandfather. And uh, bring up a uh, Japanese uh, accent, but um, you know, other than that, uh, it's I, I do have this. I'm kind of imbued with this. I've been around for a while, and uh, I it's I like to joke that I'm a banana. I'm I'm yellow on the outside, but white on the inside. And so, you know, when you're a lot of times the roles I get, I just I just book grim. And, you know, the character's name is Mr. Adams. They don't even change the last name. I don't know how many roles that I have, but they don't even change the last name. So I think I just kind of have this guy, you know, who happens to be Asian. So is, and is being a banana, is that kind of like the, the healthier version of the old uh, moniker of being a Twinkie? Oh, I haven't heard the Twinkie one. That's, that's good. You know, I, I actually, from what I understand, I think uh, banana is kind of meant to be a, a put down. <laughs> <laughs> from one Asian to the other, oh, you're not a real Asian, you're a banana. But it's like, it's so true. So it's like, I'm not even trying to hide around the fact that it might be derogatory because it's, it's true. I mean, I, I grew up eating Kentucky Fried Chicken. Yet at the same time, my mother made rice with it. So it was this kind of strange, <laughs> yeah. you know, coalescing of cultures of sorts. Well, last night on the Emmys, I, I, on the Tonys, sorry, boy, I really missed everything today. Um... Ken Wanabe. Oh, I can't even say it. Wananabe, I think. Yeah. Wananabe. Thank you. Be, stay here and just interpret. It's okay. Stay, stay tuned for next week when we bring in Red Bull. <laughs> oh, boy. That'll be fun. Yeah. Can you sing and dance because, you know, shave your head, you're in. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, I would, uh, I used to be able to sing. I, I went through uh, high school in choir, uh, but actually I play more of the trumpet. So even last night I was playing trumpet uh, with a community band that, uh, where I live. So I'm much more familiar with reading music from an instrumental perspective. Um, for those of what would happen if they called you and asked you to audition I, I, for The King and I, which is going to come out, it's going to go, since it won, mm -hmm. it, it's going to go out on, on a tour. Yeah. 
I just wanted to prepare you. And Th- thank you. I actually was asked to audition for that. Um, was not not the, not Ken's role. Um, you, you know, I, I I certainly read music. Okay. So I I could. Um, and I sing a really heck of a tune in the shower. So I sound amazing in the shower. So, uh, but no, I, I, I at least read music. Well, and I, I don't know if it was true, but I was told by an opera singer once that Pavarotti did not actually know how to read music, which is why he only sang in Italian. Oh, um, He just happened to have the voice of an angel, but. Sure. So as long as you can hear and understand and repeat, yes. maybe you don't have to know music. And as far as the dancing goes, uh, wow, we'll, we'll see. Um, we'll it's, a, it's a great thing. It's called choreography. <laughs> oh, they, there you go. They, they tell you where to go and which there beats to go. hit. Thank you. You know, I was very curious. Um, and I, I'm just going to put it out there because I think people are fascinated when they get to talk to an actor. Is How do you deal with the bottom side of acting like rejection? And I, 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 I want to ask it two ways. Let me ask it the first way. Oh, yeah. How do you deal with rejection? <laughs> we, we, We've got red. He came in so we late, light. we didn't get you a wine glass, but we'll oh, take care okay. of it. Right. Exactly. I, What's your conundrum? Is it meaty or fishy? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Is that you were in um, Fair Game. Mm-hmm. And you shot all your scenes. You were paid. Everything worked. And then discovered in the editing process that you were not going to be in Fair Game. Uh, yeah, that was actually an interesting situation. I was also in Little Fockers, uh, too. So I've, I've been in two large films uh, that didn't make the final cut. I understand uh, with Fair Game, I understand that there was actually two versions because I actually did ADR, um, dialogue replacement for Fair Game. So I knew I was in the at least the original cut. But they took two, they took, they had two versions of the film and they took one of them to Cannes and it got picked up. Uh, and can and the version that they took was the one where I was not in it. My character is in it. They mentioned my character several times in the film, but I'm actually not in that cut. So, did the, you make the DVD extras? I want no. They didn't have the deleted scenes. Oh, oh. No. I was so disappointed. Oh yeah. The internet's a whole new world. Maybe they'll release I'm some. I'm so hoping so. <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah. So the question that underneath all this stuff is, how do you deal with rejection? You know, um, it's. I, I think more than um, it, it's actually with both of those films. I, I, I. It was hard. It was really hard. It was. Those were actually the two first films that I ever shot. And you know, you're all excited. Your family's all excited. And at the end of the day, all you have is a little bit of line on your resume saying, "I booked the role," um, but you have no tape. And um, I think the only thing that I could say to myself as I was exercising and just getting out all my frustrations um, is the fact that I'm in the game. You know, I, I think just about anybody who is anybody, and even some people that are names, have their scenes cut out of films. Should we mention Kevin Costner in The Big Chill? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it didn't stop him from working, and it's, it's not stopping you from working, because yeah. you just came back from finishing um, Tina Fey's new film. Exactly. Fun... Funhouse right now. Right, right now it's called Funhouse. It's been under four different names. Okay, so the question is, when you work Working on a film yeah. <laughs> with somebody like Tina Fey, is between the scenes fun? Is there a lighter touch on a set like that because it is a comedy and because you're working with a great comedian? Or is it film as um, movie day as movie day we're shooting? You know, it was, it was, a, it was a lighter set. Um, it was a, it was, um, the, the nice part about that particular shoot is, uh, you know, the, the directors pretty much like the first three or four takes that I was able to observe because I was, of course, sitting on the side watching because they allowed me to be on set. You know, the first three or four takes was, was on script and then they just let the actors improvise. <laughs> so once I realized, okay, you can improvise and, and, and it, it became much more playful. Because, you know, kind of the goal was, can we crack up the director, you know, or can we crack up our, our scene partner or whatever it may possibly be. I never cracked up Tina at all. She was, she was good at keeping a straight face. What was one of the lines that, that you thought might be able to get her? You know, I, without giving away any of the, the plot points, I, would just, I just tried coming up, tried to obviously sticking to story. You know, you just can't, you know, out of the top of your head say, rutabaga. You know, just it, it, that has nothing to do with the story. 
Uh, but you know, you would you would just start coming up with things like I I, I was I play her boss, so you know that was a situation where they had to put a little more gray in my hair. And, you know, you just start coming up with reasons why, you know, you have to, you know, give her these instructions. And it's like, well, you know, my, my daughter's in Girl Scouts and, you know, if you could buy, you know, Girl Scout cookies. So you just start coming up with stuff. But, you know, she's such a genius. She's always, you know, five steps ahead of whatever, whatever thing I might possibly come up with. You know, she'll just take that and just run with it. So it's, it was a lot of fun. Well, I've got, I've got one, one last question for you, for me at least. Sure. Which is everything I do. She, she's studio. I'm, I'm indie, and okay. we're about passion and storytelling and breaking from the mold. Mm-hmm. I have a slogan: "Think independently," and I love to ask every every actor what that means to you. Oh my gosh, that's deep. Um, I, I'm just going to come up with the first thing that came to my mind. I'm going to pull from the all the lessons I've had with improv. I think for, for me, thinking independently is about. You know, just finding a way to to connect with the audience. You know, at the end of the day, whether or not we're in the, you know, TV radio business or we are, we, we're, we're on a feature film or, a, you know, television show, we're, we're trying to tell stories. I, th- I think, um, you know, storytelling is, is a sacred thing that kind of unites all of us. And so I think when we find ways to authentically connect and tell a story to an audience. I think that in many ways, that's for me, that's kind of what thinking independently is. Is like, is there another way for us to do this? Is, this, is, it, is there more, a more authentic way for us to be able to tell this story and, and be able to communicate something so they're, 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 you touch them in a, emotionally in a way? I love that. I think uh, you know, the word that really jumps out at me is authentic. Yeah. And I think that's, that's very important to, to stay true to that. Exactly. So I'll ask a studio type question. Okay, sure. How do you deal with fame? <laughs> I don't know. It hasn't quite happened yet. Uh, I think I was, uh, I did a Disney Channel um, made for TV movie called Lemonade Mouth, and I was, identi- I was recognized in Romania and in a tiny town in North Dakota. So those are like my, my claims to fame as far as people recognizing me. And how old were your? My audience <laughs> at that particular phase, which was right around 2011 through, they kept on running the show through about 2013, was about was preteen. So you know you're obviously very appreciative, and you know if they want autographs, you certainly sign their autographs. Um, I've got a high school reunion coming up in about three weeks, and um, so that'll be kind of interesting. Um, I, I I I hope I'm not set apart from my classmates. I just kind of want to go and just be a part and find out what everyone's doing and how their lives are. I, I'm hoping I can, for lack of a better word, just be Scott. I doubt it. I know. No, I, I, it, it'll be <laughs> wonderful. I, you know, the people from your past never forget. Sure. But um, first, you know, Scott, I really want to thank you for coming on. Well, thank and, you. And to our audience, please check out Scott's website at www.scottteketa. That's S-C-O-T-T-T-E-K. E D A dot com. T A. I know it's it's three three T's. Yeah, and it's T A K E D A. Yeah, T A K E D A dot com, and uh, good luck to you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. So, so now we'd like to uh, you know have a quick message from our sponsors, Wagner Family of Wines and Barkeeper. Wait, don't forget, and my book. My book is a sponsor too. Yes, absolutely. Ne- nearly famous tales from the Hollywood trenches. We'll be we'll be right back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Conundrum has been turning winemaking on its head for 25 years. Conundrum White is the original white wine blend from California. Pair this exotic, versatile wine with everything from Asian cuisine to tacos. Conundrum Red is rich, full-flavored, and balanced, the perfect complement to dishes like pasta pomodoro, fajitas, and barbecue. Drink it slightly chilled, perfect for summer. You'll find Conundrum Red and White Wines at your favorite restaurants, wine shops, or supermarket. Go to wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Again, that's wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Find your wine, find your adventure. 
Nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches is Reba Merrill's intriguing look at hidden Hollywood. Find out what movie stars are really like in this behind-the-scenes Hollywood tell-all. The story of Reba's extraordinary life interwoven with an insider's look at achieving fame and success in the entertainment industry. A must-read. Buy nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches at RebaMerrill.com, Amazon.com, or ask for it at fine bookstores. Nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches. You'll love it. Barkeeper in Silver Lake has the finest cocktail shakers and vintage glassware and barware from the mid-century to new. And let's not forget about Barkeeper's unique spirits, 150 different kinds of bitters, and their unique gifts. In fact, Barkeeper provided a lot of the vintage barware for Mad Men. BarkeeperSilverLake.com. Don't wait to visit their store or their website at BarkeeperSilverLake.com. It's your very own Barkeeper catalog for unique gifts. with Hollywood's Power Players. Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Reba. Starts now. Hi, welcome back to Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. We're here now talking with Herbie J. Pilato, who's an author, producer, and actually knows more about Hollywood. Than I do. Yes. I was really impressed reading all your bios mm -hmm. and all Thank the you. films you've done. Thank you. But you started out as an actor, and you look like an actor. Oh, is that good? Yeah. I think it's, <laughs> in Hollywood, you have to ask that question. Is that good? It opens doors. Yeah. I, well, I started acting uh, back in, in Rochester, New York, my hometown, and then um, I came to Los Angeles at UCLA. I uh, studied TV and film there, and uh, that's when I became really more interested um, in the behind the scenes aspects for some reason because I studied directing too. And then when I went to NBC as a page in the 80s, then I really got interested in the behind the scenes stuff. So, Well, in doing the behind the scenes stuff, you've researched and written a lot of books. And one of the things that if you're going to write about Hollywood, you, have to, you cannot ignore fame, whether it's good for you or whether it hurts. I, yeah. And I thought maybe you could give me your take on some of these people that you've written books about, yes. had, did fame destroy them or at least not give them what they expected? Well, you know, um, well, you know, let's face it, celebrities are not regular people. You know, they're just not. You know, whatever issues that the rest of us all have, you know, they're, those issues that they have are exacerbated, you know, a million times. So it's not as though they have more problems or issues than the regular person. It's just that whatever issues they have are out in front of everybody else. So they have to deal not only with, you know, the regular things that all the rest of us have to do in our regular jobs, but then they have to deal with everything else that goes along with it. But there is a flip side. What happens when they lose it? Can they handle life on life's terms? Well, prime example, I guess, is Elizabeth Montgomery, who I did several books on, you know, the biography, Twitch Upon a Star, and then I did her encyclopedia, The Essential Elizabeth Montgomery. She was a wonderful person. She, she truly was. She was a rare, um, uh, a unique individual in the Hollywood scene. Her parents were Robert Montgomery, uh, actor, and, and uh, Elizabeth Allen, a Broadway actress. So she was raised in uh, Manhattan, Beverly Hills, whatever. But she, didn't, she wasn't affected by the Hollywood scene, which I found very amazing. And she took that down-to-earth personality that she had, and she transferred it to Samantha on Bewitched. And that's why I think we all loved her. Um, so she worked against the Hollywood thing. She didn't play the Hollywood game. You know, she was nominated several times for Bewitched and then for A Case of Rape, which was her monumental uh, TV movie from 74, and then The Legend of Lizzie Borden, which uh, is celebrating the 40th anniversary of its debut this year. Um, but she was nominated, but she never won. And I think, and partially because she never won, is because she didn't go to the Hollywood parties. I was going to say, and, you, you know, know something, there really is something to the Hollywood game. Yeah. I mean, wh whether we want to talk about it or, 
or we want to pretend it isn't there. But you saw last year for the Oscars, they went to everything. Mm -hmm. And it's already started. I'm an Oscar voter. I am now doing the, the screenings. These are just for movies being released. Right. Three out of the four films that I saw this weekend had the stars mm -hmm. or the director. And it's appearing before the Academy audience. I mean, last year, out came Clint Eastwood for his film. Uh, it just so happens this past weekend, I did see uh, Love and Mercy, and Brian Williams was there. And the audience stood up and applauded. Well, let me tell you something. The studio that's releasing it is going to take note of the response and yeah. plan their marketing and publicity off of that. I so was there. I saw that film. You saw that? that? That night, yeah. Oh, you were at the Academy, too? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so you yeah. saw the game. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's it's what it's every business does that, whether it's Hollywood or whether it's you're an accountant in a big firm. It's, you know, it's it's networking and, and politics and, and everything. If you have talent, you know, which Elizabeth Montgomery did, then that's great. So, um, uh, but what drew you specifically to Elizabeth? Yeah. Did you know? Did what, what drew you specifically to Elizabeth to spend so much time yeah. focusing on her life? Yeah, uh, well, I grew up, like I said, in Rochester, and I, I guess I was bullied as a kid, you know, and uh, beat up a lot. I was a cute little kid, and I had all little girls, and all the little boys didn't like that, so they beat me up. And uh, um, so I felt the sense of isolation that Samantha had on Bewitched. And the show was about prejudice to me in many ways. And many minorities are attracted to the show over the years. And so that drew me to it. But I also, as I got older, I realized there was a true love that was going on on that show between those two people, that Samantha uh, loved Darren for who he was and not for what he could buy her. Because whatever he could buy her, um, she could switch up something better. She didn't love him for his money or nothing. So that amazed me as, as I was started into the dating scene or whatever. Um, so I just felt um, just drawn to it and compelled to it, compelled to be a, uh, to be a somehow war be a part of that show and and to uh, spread its message of strong work ethic and 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 humanity and all of that. And it sounds silly for a little silly uh, people what pe people see as a silly sitcom, but it's not. There was a lot there. So then I wrote a reunion for it, a TV reunion movie, and Elizabeth didn't want to do that. And I said, well, how about we do a book? And then I did the Bewitched book, and then did a second Bewitched book, and then I did her life story. Wait a minute. So you dealt with her. You, this oh, yes. wasn't just done on At I the should library, go. no. <laughs> oh, well, then you have to. Okay, so you have to tell us more. Let's talk about the marriage. There were a couple of them. Which one? The, the, the one with. Um, there was Bill Asher. That one. Because he um, was very famous, too. Oh, gosh. He was very talented, very famous. He, of course, did. I Love Lucy, he directed the Patty Duke show, he did all the, those great beach party movies. Um, and the movie that he directed with Elizabeth and where they met was, um, it's... It's okay, yeah, I don't remember geez, much Johnny, today, go Johnny ahead. Johnny Angel, <laughs> Johnny Angel or, or, or something, that, I think that's the title. And they met on the first uh, day and they didn't get along, they hated each other, it was a love-hate relationship. <laughs> she was late or something, he didn't like that and then I guess the next day they fell in love. So there you go. But they were very strong-willed, both very independent people and both very talented people, but they had a great respect for each other. And even after the show ended, when, when they finally did Bewitched, uh, they stayed very close because of their children, who, by the way, are wonderful people, and who Elizabeth raised as um, with, with good priorities and sound priorities, the same that she had. And and what was your relationship with her like? Because you clearly spent a tremendous amount of time with her and, and yeah. got to know her very intimately. I did. I did. She was, um, I convinced her that I really believed in Bewitched and, and the sweet message of it. And she did not give interviews. She was very private, very, very private person. But Bill Asher really had talked with her about me and said, you really need to talk to Herbie. You know, Herbie's really concerned with this Bewitched thing. Okay, but I have to, how did that start? How did you get in that to, door? Into that's Bill a Asher. big. Yeah. That's a big door. It was Irving. a big door. Yeah. It was a big door. Uh, Bill Asher happened to be doing a new Bewitched, a new Bewitched series. He was developing one in the '80s, and I, because I had written the reunion script for what I envisioned Samantha and Darren getting back together, I sent him that script on spec, and he really liked it, and he hired me to be on the staff for the new Bewitched. Unfortunately, that new Bewitched show didn't go, and then I had all this Bewitched energy. 
And I says, what do you think, Elizabeth? She didn't want to do the reunion, and she was apparently going to make this cameo in the new Bewitched. She was going to pop in and, and introduce this new witch and this new mortal and then pop off. Um, I said, if she you know, doesn't want to do the, uh, the TV movie, and I know she's obviously now the new show isn't going to happen, will she want to do this new Bewitched or this Bewitched book? And so finally she agreed. Um, I, I called her. He gave me her number. She goes, okay, give her. He told Bill Asher, give him, give him my number. I'm like, okay, fine, great. So six months later, after six months of phone calls uh, to her house, she finally called me back. And I'll never forget it because I was doing the laundry and I missed her call, and there she was and with my, her message on my machine. <laughs> she goes, hi, it's Lizzie Montgomery. I'm like, Lizzie? What do you mean Lizzie? You know, I'm Elizabeth Montgomery. So Okay, so I, I got to ask this. You've been around Hollywood has, for a long time, just like I have. What's your take on how tough it is to make it in this town? Well, you know, uh, making it has to, I think the most important thing for anyone, whether you want to be an actor, a director, a writer, whatever it is, that you live your life first. You know, you, you, you concern yourself with having barbecues and having coffee with, with people, your neighbors and your family. And if the other, the other stuff comes, great. Just don't be attached to it. And, and then you just, you go with the flow. If this doesn't work, I started out as an actor. I sang, I danced. I was a stand-in dancer for Solid Gold in the 80s. So I was doing all these different things, and then I just focused, you know. And, and it's, just, it's just about focus, but living your life first. And, and don't make the career the center of your life. Oh, I take that. Well, that's, that's great. And, I mean, you certainly, of all people that I've met, have, you, you created your own future. You paved your own way. And I think that that is more possible than ever with the indie world. So we posed this, this question to Scott, but uh, I, I've come up with a slogan in everything I do, uh, think independently. And I always like to ask, what's that mean to you? Well, you know, we all care what other people think, and I think we should. You know, but if it's going to devastate you, uh, what the public opinion is, or what your your friends think of you, or what your family thinks of you, it's not good. So you just have to have a strong sense of self, and a very strong faith in whatever, however you choose to call God, as long as it's good, uh, and and I think you'll be all right. You know, but you have to have those other things in your life. You have to have some kind of spiritual sense, some kind of life beyond Hollywood or whatever, and and just you know, do good and be kind. I mean, it's, to me, that's, that's what independence is, is, is knowing that you're a good person and you're not out to hurt anyone and just uh, move forward joyfully in all you do. Well, thank well, you so much. No, I yeah. think we have, don't we have, like, t okay, we do. Okay, yeah, you got, so, you got time for another Okay, question. one of the things that's interesting is that the Internet. We have shows like TMZ, which to mm. me is called Gotcha. Yeah. Or how do you think this is affecting your view on the way Hollywood is going now, the entertainment industry is going now. Well, I think it's not just Hollywood. It's like all news. Whenever anything happens today, I mean, this, the news doesn't even ha give it a chance for a story to develop. I mean, it's it's every second. And that, that's no fun. You know, you don't want to see uh, everything happening at once. You want to have some an, an event happen, transpire, and then two days later look at it or the next day in the newspaper. But if everything happens immediate. It's, it doesn't become the news, it becomes life, which, and everything gets blurred. Is this life or is this a report? Is this a show or is this life? Certainly with reality programming, we're seeing that. So it's, it's too much of a blur. There, there has to be some separation. Well, let me ask you something. You're fascinating, you know, and, and you, you, you played in a sandbox that very few of us get an opportunity to play in. Obviously, you knew her well enough, or she was comfortable with you, yes. that Elizabeth Montgomery would say, Hi, Liz, I'm Lizzie. It's true. When the sandbox was empty, when it was over, how did you deal with that? Oh, you know, that's a very interesting question because before I met her, I was just not doing the writing, but I was you know, performing throughout Hollywood and whatnot. And I just felt that she, when I, after I met her, Nothing else mattered. It was very strange. Actually, when I, when I met her, I went back to New York and take, took care of my parents because they were older and they didn't have anyone. And I couldn't abandon them. And I didn't really think that God was going to abandon my goals if I, didn't abandon, you know, if, if I didn't abandon my parents or if I did abandon my parents. So I, I lost all my 
objectives and goals. It was very, very strange, and it took me years to to really come back. But had I not lose that, lost those goals, I don't know if I would have cared for my parents the way I did. And I don't know if the work that I'm doing now would have been as good, I think, had it not been because I was caring for my parents and I became a different person. Well, we ran out Herbie, of time. Herbie, thank you so much. I wish we had more time, but for everybody watching, you can get Herbie's best-selling books at Amazon.com. And the specific link will be on our on the visual on our chat. Uh, you can also follow Herbie at um, on his blog, which is uh, herbiejpilato.blogspot.com. So please uh, sign up and tune in to learn everything that he knows and be a part of this amazing world that he's giving us insights into. And uh, we'll be right back. Uh, but first, uh, once again, I'd like to thank our awesome sponsors, Wagner Family of Wines, Barkeeper, Nearly Famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches. That's me. <laughs> and Film Festival Flicks. We'll be right back. Conundrum has been turning winemaking on its head for 25 years. Conundrum White is the original white wine blend from California. Pair this exotic, versatile wine with everything from Asian cuisine to tacos. Conundrum Red is rich, full-flavored, and balanced, the perfect complement to dishes like pasta pomodoro, fajitas, and barbecue. Drink it slightly chilled, perfect for summer. You'll find Conundrum Red and White wines at your favorite restaurants, wine shops, or supermarket. Go to wagnerfamilyofwine.com Again, that's wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Find your wine, find your adventure. Nearly Famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches is Reba Merrill's intriguing look at hidden Hollywood. Find out what movie stars are really like in this behind-the-scenes Hollywood tell-all. The story of Reba's extraordinary life interwoven with an insider's look at achieving fame and success in the entertainment industry. A must-read. Buy nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches at RebaMerrill.com, Amazon.com, or ask for it at fine bookstores. Nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches. You'll love it. Barkeeper in Silver Lake has the finest cocktail shakers and vintage glassware and barware from the mid-century to new. And let's not forget about Barkeeper's unique spirits, 150 different kinds of bitters, and their unique gifts. In fact, Barkeeper provided a lot of the vintage barware for Mad Men. BarkeeperSilverLake.com. Don't wait to visit their store or their website at BarkeeperSilverLake.com. It's your very own Barkeeper catalog for unique gifts. with Hollywood's Power Players. Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Starts now. So we had some amazing guests, and I guess it's time to come back to that discussion we were having at the beginning of the show. About sex? If that's what you like. Oh, I don't want to discuss Sorry, I'm, that. Sorry, I'm, I'm Indy, it's beneath me. <laughs> You're putting me in an awkward position. Now, I was really, when I asked you... Oh, I have so many innuendos. <laughs> <laughs> when I asked you about sex in the indie world, uh, I thought maybe because they were so pure and so dedicated to telling that story and that money was not what was driving them, I thought their sex and, and the, the casting couch was going to be different than what I found in the studio world. No, it's at the end of the day, it's still manipulative, greedy people preying on other people's hopes and dreams. How did you describe me so well? That was so true. Because I, I was, when I first came up to Hollywood, I was a woman of a certain age. I'm not doing numbers. And um, my first job interview with a tape of working for CBS with an Emmy, I was offered a job in a major studio doing as many interviews as I wanted. If I would, um, I won't use the expression he used, um, three times a week. I, I've, I, I've seen it all. And the only thing I can say, at least in the indie world, 
is you don't have to go that path. I do. Nine more. And, and that's what, like where Herbie said, you have to have a sense of self. Um, if, if you know who you are, then you're not going to fall prey to that. If you come out here so desperate, thinking that the first person who says that they can make your career, then you're going to fall prey to that. And those are the people that do lose their sense of self and eventually go home with their tail between their legs. Okay. But you're describing me again because I thought this was the only way to get into the Hollywood studio system for what I wanted to do. And ironically, I didn't do it. And guess what? It took me eight years to work for that studio. But you did it. Yeah, but you know something? Let's be honest. If he was good looking, maybe I would have acquiesced, but he wasn't. Well, again, it goes back to my <laughs> statement of, you know, what's flirting versus harassment. <laughs> I think I just flirt. It just comes out. I don't mean to flirt. It just does. Since I was a kid, it's like this. You know, I look at you, and you get away saying things to me that nobody's ever said to me before. And you say it in front of my husband, too, which is really surprising. No. So the thing is that we've decided that the casting couch is the same. But the casting couch is different than having a producer say to, say to the financier. No, the financier say to the producer, I'll get you the money for your film if you put my girlfriend in. That's not the, the, the legit financiers, the legit producers. They're there to make real stories, and they are also in it for a business. They're not there to put people's girlfriends in. They're not there to get laid. They're legit. So, all I can say is is that it's not that the craft doesn't get made, but if you're serious about your craft and you're serious and and to take uh, Scott's line, if you're authentic about telling the story, then I think it's good to be true to yourself and to stay out of those trenches. It took me a long time to be true to myself, but I am. Sitting in this chair, I'm true to myself. Yeah. So true that I'm going to have you tell me who's on the show next week. Well, you know, first of all, I'd like to thank our guests, Scott and Herbie. Both were absolutely amazing. And I'd also like to thank our awesome sponsors, Wagner Family of Wines, Barkeeper Silver Lake, uh, Nearly Famous, Tales from the Hollywood Trenches. Me. And Film Festival <laughs> Flicks. And next week, uh, we're very lucky. We have filmmaker Charles Agron and Josh Adikoff. From the famous Adikoff screening room. This is a dynasty. We're going to find out about a Hollywood dynasty. Yes, they do exist. Yes. Uh, so uh, if you, you, know, you, can, you can watch the recap of the show uh, on uh, youtube.com forward slash Reba Merrill. You can also see it on Film Festival Flicks at filmfestivalflicks.com forward slash real dash dash Hollywood dash live. And you can download the podcast of The Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba uh, page from ubnradio.com as well as iTunes. We're on Channel One. That's right. So tune in next week. We're here every Tuesday uh, at 1 p.m. Pacific time at ubnradio.com channel one. And you know what? I get to say the most important words on any film set, that's a wrap. Perfect. Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Real Hollywood.